The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. My name is Misty Blevins with Rural Hospital Services and Solutions. Welcome to the Reducing Hospitalizations and 30-Day Readmissions for Post-Acute Care Patients educational webinar sponsored by NRHA Platinum Partner, AMD Global Telemedicine. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items. Please note that throughout the presentation, all participants will be placed on mute. If you need to communicate with me during the webinar, feel free to use the chat or question section on your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would like to turn the presentation over to Ron Emerson. All right, thank you very much. It's uh, good to be here. So, Carrie, do you want to take over um, from here? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So today, hi everybody. I'm Carrie Dosti from AMD Global Telemedicine, and today you'll hear from AMD Global Telemedicine as well as Telehealth Solution and Appalachian Regional Healthcare System to find out how telemedicine is allowing them to treat more patients in place, avoiding unnecessary hospital transfers, and drastically reducing their readmission rates. From AMD Global Telemedicine, we have Ron Emerson, who's the Global Director of Strategic and Partner Development. Uh, from Telehealth Solution, we have Jason Perlman, who's the President and Co-Founder of Telehealth Solution. Uh, from Glenbridge Health and Rehab, um, actually Colleen Anderson won't be able to make the presentation today, um, but we have Robin Fox from Appalachian Regional Healthcare System, who's going to talk about the program that Appalachian has with Glenbridge uh, together. So as value-based care increases, developing different delivery models to reduce unnecessary 30-day readmission hospitals, hospital readmissions and length of stay is a key challenge for any healthcare organization globally. By the use of telehealth, rural long-term care facilities and acute care facilities have avoided 88% of readmissions or more. In today's objectives for the webinar, we're going to tell you a little bit more about the CMS mandate um, that imposes 2% penalty of Medicare reimbursement for higher than average hospital readmission rates. Also help you understand the clinical benefits of implementing telehealth in post-acute care facilities and how it positively positively affects patient care and reimbursement. And then finally, also give you a, a real customer use case. And so you can learn how rural long-term care facilities and hospitals have been able to successfully work together to improve patient care and their bottom line. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jason Perlman. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Sorry, a little technical difficulty, a little delay in there. All right, to get started off here, we're going to go through a few definitions just to help you better understand the presentation today and understanding what a hospital readmission is or the new language that is out there and returns to acute. So, um, as most of you know already, 30-day readmission or return to acute is a patient presenting back to the hospital within 30 days of discharge from their prior hospital stay. This has been a very difficult issue in the hospital world and especially amongst Medicare patients out there, given that about one in five Medicare patients are readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. The big problem with this is the financial side of this. There is a very costly side to Medicare and loss of revenue on the hospital associated with this. It's estimated that this is a $26 billion problem annually with avoidable readmissions accounting for about 17 billion of this. So this very quickly became a big area of focus for Medicare uh, and a big issue among hospitals and hospital systems.
So just to understand why this is very appropriate, especially in the rural health setting out there, is multiple studies out there have been done that have shown that patients discharged from hospitals in the rural settings have a 37% higher risk of unplanned readmissions as in compared to those discharged from the urban setting in there. So obviously the financial impact of this, given the minimal resources in rural America becomes a large problem. There's a lot of research that's gone into this and CMS has put a lot of initiatives into place to help better understand this. The Duke Endowment does a lot of research and recently released a report recommending telemedicine as the number one way to reduce readmissions in rural communities out there, which is what we're gonna talk about and dive into a little deeper today. So just to understand a little bit about the impact on skilled nursing facilities is to understand how reimbursement works in relation to these 30-day readmissions. On average, typical Medicare patient facility will receive around $415 per day for each day patient is in the facility in there. The reason why this becomes such an issue is any patient that is within that window that gets sent back to the hospital will ultimately have to have a financial detriment to the facility based on the readmission. Reason being is that $415 a day is withheld from the facility and they have to hold on to that bed. So given that an average hospital stay is somewhere in that four to seven day window, average readmission is roughly $2,000 of lost revenue for the skilled nursing facility. Even though the financial impact is large, more importantly, it's the impact on the patients. The skilled nursing facility residents, it takes a large difficulty on the patient side in there, given that you have a prolonged hospital stay, it's difficulty in transferring between care settings. A good majority of patients in the long-term care settings have a component of dementia. We know the biggest risk for patients of developing acute delirium with underlying dementia is, is change in care settings in there. So this becomes a, a huge issue, especially given that the majority of these readmissions take place during the night. Other issues that play into this as well are things such as poor nutrition given the change in condition, infection, along with additional other medical complications. So CMS has done a significant amount of research regarding rehospitalizations out there. And the largest players in the market always tend to fall within five diseases or disease states in there. They've said that these five conditions listed there are responsible for about 80% of the return to acutes in there. These include CHF, COPD and asthma, dehydration, pneumonia, and urinary tract infection. All of these that we'll learn about later are very treatable things within the facility that a good majority of the time don't need to be transferred to the hospital. So as we talked about previously and elaborating a little further on why this is such a big issue for skilled nursing facilities. Well, given the large cost of billions of dollars associated with this, this has become a large issue on the radar for CMS. So the government is now collecting a lot of data surrounding this and has now created a reimbursement packet surrounded about the money that's going to be withheld from reimbursement from these facilities. This all was initiated with the implementation of the Protecting Access to Medicare Act in association with the value-based purchasing program. These rehospitalization provisions hold both hospitals and SNF responsible for patients who return to the hospital within 30 days of discharge. Okay, we're going to, uh, just give me a moment, we're going to launch a poll question. Okay, you should see the question on your screen. 
Um, how familiar are you with Medicare's Protecting Access to Medicare Act and the SNF Value-Based Purchasing Program? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar at all? And we'll give a few minutes for everybody to put in their answers. Okay, I'll close the poll in just a moment, give a few people a little more time. Okay. So it looks like 6% of you are very familiar, 33% somewhat familiar, and 60% are not familiar at all. So um, that gives it back to you, Jay, to talk a little more about that. Thank you, Terry. All right, so since a large majority of you weren't very familiar about the Protecting Access to Medicare Act and associated with the value-based purchasing program, we're gonna take a little time now to go into a little more detail about what this means and what this means to facility, how this affects reimbursement along with what, what the future holds for facilities and organizations. So to understand a little bit more about what, what CMS does is as of October 1st of this year, they initiated this mandate. With this mandate, CMS is now withholding 2% of skilled nursing facility Medicare payments. So what that means is across the board, that 2% is going to be withheld from all organizations across the country universally. CMS is then going to take that money and redistribute a portion of that back to the facilities based on performance measures. So 30 to 50% of that is going to be retained by Medicare as a savings program for Medicare and that other bundle is going to be redistributed to the skilled nursing facility. So that money is going to be distributed based on performance standards for SNFs along with um, achievements and a scoring methodology that's going to be used to determine how that money is distributed and how much money they are going to get. So to understand a little bit how that works, you can see on this grass graph here how this reimbursement is going to take place and how this is going to affect the fee for service in there. So essentially what's going to happen is there's a scoring system from zero to hundred with readmissions playing one of the largest components of that bucket. Each year this data will be collected and that money will be redistributed based on what that scoring system is. And the way it will work is skilled nursing facilities with the highest rankings, which the largest component of that being preventing these 30-day readmissions in there are going to receive incentive payments and the skilled nursing facilities with the low rankings are going to get less money. So how does this equate to dollar values to the skilled nursing facility? So essentially that 2% in there, you, you have the chance where you may lose that full 2% or you may gain an additional up to between 1.5 and 2% in reimbursement in there. If you follow the way these curves work, it, turns out that around the lowest 40% of SNFs out there are going to be reimbursed less than the pre-PAMA time period in there. So that 2% overall affects large organizations considerably, but also the small organizations out there as well as 2% of revenue can equate to a large dollar amount. Therefore, most players in the post-acute care setting are moving towards initiatives to prevent these 30-day readmissions. And as we mentioned previously, telemedicine is found to be the most successful way to achieve that. So just to go into a little bit and understand how telemedicine is so important in preventing these readmissions, we're gonna go through a typical case that, that we see at Telehealth Solution on a nightly basis with our clients across the country. So 
Ms. Smith, an 86-year-old man, is in short-term rehab. The patient was in the hospital with a recent stroke and came to the facility with a peg tube for nutrition given he was unable to swallow any further. Got admitted over at the facility. Shortly after admission to the facility around 3 a.m. in the morning, nursing went to check on the patient, found that he was coughing and felt that they should check on him a little bit further. The nurse went to go get the vital signs monitor machine, evaluated the patient, found that he had a significantly elevated temperature of 103.7. His breathing was very labored with a respiratory rate around 26. Blood pressure was fairly normal around 110 over 62. However, his oxygen level was significantly low down at 80% on room air. At that time, with the nursing staff recognizing that the patient had a significant change in condition, the nurse calls the on-call provider, and what happens the good majority of the time in the nursing facility is the patient is sent to the ER immediately by the physician on call for the facility. So in the typical scenario with the medical director that has a knee-jerk reflex to send the patient to the ER, what normally happens, 911's called, patient's transported via ambulance to the emergency room. Patient is found to be septic, pneumonia on chest x-ray, started on broad spectrum antibiotics, and sent up to the floor. Outside of the acute medical condition that's going on, all of those other effects that we talked about from acutely transferring patients have a significant effect on the patient. So as we spoke about earlier, these transitions from one facility to the other are a huge risk factor for patients becoming agitated and delirious. And it's not uncommon in the emergency room during the middle of the night transfers that Patients become agitated, ended up getting heavily medicated by the emergency room doctor due to ag agitation in there, and often get put in restraints, whether that be chemical restraints or physical restraints. Given patient was found to have mild criteria for sepsis and pneumonia, patient's going to be admitted to the hospital for likely a minimum of four days. Skilled nursing facility is going to get penalized for the 30-day readmission and lose all of that reimbursement while the patient is in the hospital. The result and effect of that is Ms. Smith, Mr. Smith has taken a significant step back in the rehab potential, further getting weakened by transfer of care, being moved multiple times from the facility to the emergency room to the step-down unit, then transferred to the floor and then transferred back to the facility. This becomes a very difficult and emotional toll on the patient and also difficult for families. In addition, you have all the additional costs incurred to the patient, including ambulance ride, ER bills, physician bills, and the significant costs the hospital is going to charge them for a several day stay in the hospital. So let's talk a little bit about that same patient scenario, but let's talk about how this would be different for the facility, the patient, the family, in regards to having telemedicine on board and in the facility. So as we talked about, generally during that middle of the night phone call, the provider on call has that reflex to say, patient's oxygen's low, send them to the hospital. The benefit of the telemedicine is we have the ability to have a visualization of the patient in there, have diagnostic modalities very similar to the bedside with our telemedicine carts that are in place. So in this situation, the nurse would call the telehealth doctor on call. We would get a brief sign out on the patient, updated vital signs. We would ask them to wheel the telemedicine unit into the room in there. We would evaluate the patient. We would take as much of a comprehensive history as possible in the room. We would then perform an exam assisted by the RN on site in there. Then we would have open communication with the nurse about the game plan and course of action to treat this patient in place. 
So in this scenario, given patient likely had aspiration pneumonia, given that he had a recent PEG2 placement and placed on tube feeds, patient would be placed NPO for 24 hours. We would have a follow-up speech eval and nutrition eval. We would obtain lab work, including a CBC and a basic metabolic panel. We would obtain a chest X-ray to confirm the clinical suspicion of aspiration pneumonia, in addition to a KUB, which is an abdominal X-ray, to ensure there was no ileus or any other clinical condition that may have contributed to the patient's significant acute decline. We would initiate antibiotic therapy appropriate for aspiration pneumonia, getting a dose uh, immediately in the patient. We would patient place patient on supplemental oxygen, order PRN nebulizers, uh, and also place the patient on N, uh, IV fluids while they were unable to have their pig feeds uh, initiated and placed on hold given the aspiration in there. The reason why this becomes so successful and, and effective is because, especially in these patients with sepsis, you really have a four-hour clinical window where it makes the difference between a short course of pneumonia with minimal adverse effects versus a prolonged ICU stay in there. Quick initiation of IV fluids and prompt initiation of antibiotics really changes the clinical course in all of these patients. In the alternative scenario in there, you have got uh, a call out to the medical director, which oftentimes in the middle of the night may take 30 minutes to an hour to call back. By the time that call takes place, at that point, 911's called. You wait for the ambulance to come in. The ambulance has to into the facility, get to the patient's room, get them on the stretcher, get them back out, drive to the hospital, take that same transition into the facility. At that point, you are generally you may be three hours out and have missed the window of the clinical opportunity to prevent the full sepsis pathway from being initiated. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Um, and now we're gonna hand it over to Ron Emerson with AMD. All right, thank you very much, uh, Carrie, and, and uh, um, thank you, Dr. Perlman. So um, first of all, as I go to the first slide, Oops, there you go. First of all, uh, I'm just going to give an overview of telemedicine. So um, Dr. Perlman did a very nice job of outlining why this is so important. I think, you know, just sort of a good foundation for all of us have is, you know, just the understanding of, um, you know, the complications we have when we look at geography and we look at demographics and, and why is telemedicine continuing to grow and why is it uh, such an important topic and why are you folks here today? I think uh, based on what Dr. Perlman showed us, but based on all what we know in our day-to-day -day clinical practices, that you know there's a direct correlation between access to care and quality to care. And um, the other kind of key issue with telemedicine, and the whole reason we're here is because you know it's more e efficient to move information than it is to move people, right? Especially when um, geography doesn't allow us to do this. So for some of you that are new, I'm just going to give an overview of what telemedicine is. Um, um, what you're going to hear is sort of two terms. You're going to hear telemedicine and telehealth, and then sometimes you'll hear e-health. Um, in most in in most circles, and it'll it'll vary a little bit. But telehealth is really more the the broad um, definition, which just simply means the use of digital technology um, for professionals to evaluate, diagnose, treat patients. So in, in simple terms, it's the transfer of electronic medical data. Okay, so telehealth. For some people, that could mean, um, I'll show you in the next slide, a lot of different things because there's different versions of it. Um, what we're really talking about today with telehealth solutions and Dr. Perlman and, and um, the other speakers is we're really talking about um, um, more of a live interaction between a clinician and a patient from a distance, okay? And what we're trying to do with that version of telemedicine is we're trying to provide as close to possible the same level of care as we would as if the clinician was in the same room with the patient, okay? So when you look at the different varieties of it, we can look at real-time audio video, which is what Dr. Perlman talked about, seeing the patient interacting, having the nurses or the other clinicians there to help facilitate the exam. Um, there's other types of telemedicine store and forward, Mobile applications, you've heard of mHealth and remote monitoring. Uh, just to cover these very quick, 
Federal Advance. Oh, got a poll question. Okay, before you go into, before Ron goes into some more explanation on telemedicine and telehealth, we want to ask our second poll question. How many of you are currently using telemedicine for patient care? Um, yes, we either have a telehealth program or no, we don't currently have a telehealth program. So go ahead and put in your answers. And this will help Ron kind of tailor um, the next slide of information on, you know, the different types of telemedicine, uh, different areas that can be used based on um, how much of you are very familiar with it already. Give it a few more minutes. It looks like some of you are still voting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll. Very interesting split. It's about half, half and half. So 52%, so slightly more, uh, do currently have a telehealth program, and 48% do not. Go ahead, Ron, you can go ahead and advance the slide now. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, that's an interesting split. It'd be interesting to know um, um, what types of telemedicine, which is what I'm gonna talk about now, so going back. So let's just talk about how telemedicine works and the, the different types of, of telemedicine. Um, so first of all, uh, the, 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 the focus that we're here for today, talking about um, skilled nursing facilities and providing care is really the top one, diagnostic real-time, telemedicine. Um, and Dr. Perlman gave a nice overview of what the scenario looks like. But this is all about, as I said before, from a distance, we want to provide the same, as close to possible, the same level of care as if the clinician was in the same room. So you have a clinician on one side, they could be on their, their desktop, they could be in a computer, in their home, in their office. So the clinician has the flexibility to be wherever they want to be. On the patient side, you have some sort of cart device, or it could be a wall-mounted unit, where you have medical peripheral devices where you can provide that high level of assessment to provide the highest level of clinical efficacy as possible. Um, another type that folks might be familiar with is what we're talking about the different types of telemedicine, remote patient monitoring. Um, we know we see a lot of this, of course, uh, um, post-discharge uh, for congestive heart failure, COPD. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, these devices go in the home with the, the patient. The clinician works with the home health nursing agency usually, and they basically set the parameters, um, the biometric, and you could have a 100 patients on this, and let's say it's a CHF patient, and they gain a couple kilos overnight, their O2 sats are low, it'll alarm, and it'll notify the nurses or whoever's monitoring the patient that that patient's out of parameter, so we can try to stop an exacerbation and an unnecessary rehospitalization. Um, store and Florida is another type. Um, uh, store in Florida is basically, let's use it as a skilled nursing facility. If you have decubiti or, of course, dermatology, you take subjective data, what the patient says, objective data, what you see in the images you take, and when it's appropriate with specific clinical applications, store in Florida is there, but it's not by far not one of the largest. Um, and a lot of this is driven by um, what can actually be reimbursed and paid for. And then the next one we're just going to touch over real quick is direct to consumer. Uh, this is about basically clinicians being in any location, and based on the intent, the clinical intent, you can basically uh, connect into a clinician and get information. And if they cannot provide the right or provide the right level of assessment and get the right amount of objective data, they can basically refer you on or send you to um, um, the right location where you can. So, just kind of an overview. So, for some of you that are new to this, these are the types of telemedicine. But, but then again, as I get back to the original. Um, we really want to talk about uh, the specifics of the purpose of the, the session today. So we're talking about diagnostic telemedicine, and let's just talk a little bit about how telemedicine helps prevent readmission. So I think, first of all, for those of us that have been, it's interesting to see 52% have been in telemedicine, and I've been doing it for 22 years. I used to run a telehealth network many years ago, and the technology has come so far, right? And, and I think, you know, our goal has always been really three things, right, is, you know, how do we make patients and have high levels of satisfaction. And I, I think you'll find out patient satisfaction is rather high. Um, it's usually above 90th percentile with, with most um, 
um, um, evaluations and then clinical efficacy. Can we provide quality care? And, um, you know, um, Dr. Perlman talked about some of that. And then, of course, the, the cost benefit and the ROI of um, how we can help reduce uh, increased revenue or reduce costs for organizations, but doing good things for parents. So um, how does it help prevent? I talked about, you know, the, the, the quality care and access to care. With SNFs, um, you know, we can have easy accessibility to physicians on demand. So we don't have, as Dr. Perlman said, we don't have the exacerbations and we don't have conditions worsening to the point where they end up being these long-term, um, more chronic uh, inpatient hospital stays, which are very hard on the patient first and foremost, but also very expensive. Um, patient uh, Telemedicine allows a patient to receive thorough exams um, when a change in medical status occurs. So we can be there immediately allowing for early detection and management, right? I think we've all seen, um, of, of course, time, and Dr. Perlman gave a, 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 a great example of, a, of um, um, pneumonia. Um, telemedicine physicians can provide a diagnosis and treatment plan in real time and order additional labs and tests based on capabilities of each facility. Now, as we look over to the right and we look at the skilled nursing package, what's really interesting and really important, as I said earlier, about telemedicine technology and where has it come to? The first thing is, you have to have that live interaction between the clinician and the patient, and um, you know we're able to do that. Um, a nurse is there with the patient, but what's really amazing about this technology now and the technology that Telehealth Solutions um, uses is that we can provide um, a number of medical devices um, and connect different technology into these platforms so they can provide very high-level assessments. So we can use digital death, um, stethoscopes, um, you can literally instantly do a 12 lead EKG and it shows up instantly on the side where the clinician is so they can look at it. Literally, it's a 15 second strip. They hook them up and they go and it can be there within um, 30 seconds. Um, vital sign monitors, um, including, of course, pulse, pulse oximetry. We're looking at COPD and, and, of course, congestive heart failure, all of these other things that are important. We have vital sign monitors that we can put in. Um, otoscopes, general exam cameras, dermoscopes. Um, we can even do um, ultrasounds. We can do abdominal ultrasounds, vaginal ultrasounds. We can um, um, we can do spirometry. So uh, there's over 40 different devices that you can actually connect into this technology uh, to provide that high level assessment we're talking about. So how does telemedicine help prevent readmissions? I think we covered some of this already, but early intervention, right? By a telehospitalist will prevent conditions from worsening if we don't have the exacerbations. Um, treat uh, patients in place. Um, we don't want them to return to the acute care setting and it improves the outcomes and quality measure measures for SNFs and hospitals. And it also, of course, decreases risk to patients and, and helps uh, um, address all those issues that Dr. Perlman talked about either. Um, it avoids preventable readmissions and penalties um, and incentive payments. And of course, you know, as I say, the, the, one of the, the biggest things that it does is as I said, it's more efficient to move information than it is people. And, and um, you know, we can get those that specialize in this area, tell a hospitalist, um, they see these sort of acute conditions day in and day out, and they're the best physicians to treat the patients in place regardless of where they're located and regardless of where the physician is located. And on that note, um, I'll hand it back over to Carrie. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Um, now I'm going to introduce you Robin Fox with Appalachian Regional Healthcare System. And Robin's going to talk to you today about kind of their use case and how they work together with Glenbridge Health and Rehab and Telehealth Solution to uh, implement the use of telemedicine at their facility, um, which ultimately affected their patient outcomes. Robin? Thank you, Carrie. Whoops. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Glenbridge. Colleen uh, was sorry that she couldn't be with us today. Um, Glenbridge Health and Rehab is a uh, skilled nursing facility in Boone, North Carolina, licensed for 134 beds. And we have, uh, we are the main referral source for them. Uh, our Watauga Medical Center is the hospital in Boone. And once they implemented the telemedicine program in March, of 2017, you can see on the graph to the right how their readmissions drastically declined. There was actually one month in January of 2017 where every patient that we discharged to them were readmitted within 30 days. So they knew that they really needed to work on this. And so luckily they were connected with um, 
Dr. Perlman and his group, and so they were able to implement this program. And so they have the coverage for nights and weekends, and then they have the coverage for the phones. Six months prior to the implementation, their return to hospital average was about 56%. And then um, only five patients had to return to acute care once they started with telemedicine. And another point to that is that the physicians that were um, the telehealth physicians, they actually had provided care in our hospital. And so they had uh, credibility with the ER physician. So when they would call and talk with the ER physician or the physicians in the facility, they are, were known and trusted. And so that, I think that was very helpful as well. Total, um, they had 147 calls to the telehealth hospitalist within the last six months and 100% of those patients were treated in place that didn't require hospitalization. And you can see the most common reasons that they called was chest pain, UTI and sepsis, and then COPD and pneumonia. And again, since they have implemented the telemedicine, they've reduced their hospital readmissions, They've improved the capability of treating in place, which Dr. Perlman was talking about how taxing it is for patients to have to come to the hospital and, you know, the worry that it ha their families have and the toll it takes on the caregivers as well. So they're able to stay there in their warm bed and, and be treated in place. It has improved the relationship with our hospital system. We've been working very closely with them and are very proud of the the steps that they've taken to reduce these hospital readmissions. It's improved the confidence with their staff, and it also gives the doctors a, the ability to do some education with the nurses on the phone when they call in. As you, many of you know, patients now in skilled nursing facilities are much more sick than they were, say, 10 years ago, and we're seeing that on the hospital side as well. And it's improved the revenue as patients are remaining in-house and the Medicare reimbursement um, isn't lost for the facility. Back in the fall, they were actually, Glenbridge was actually recognized during the High Country Care Transition Summit for the best practice by CMS for utilizing the telehealth. So I know that they were very excited about that. And just a little bit about Watauga Medical Center. We're part of Appalachian Regional Healthcare System, and we are a um, multi-hospital system. Uh, Watauga Medical is licensed for 117 beds, and um, we have seen a huge re reduction in readmissions, and it's improved our readmissions overall as well, our scores. And then the, I talked about the direct MD to MD. In the past, the ER physicians, when they would get a patient from Glenbridge, they were very reluctant to send the patient back because they weren't confident that they could treat the patient. And so that many times they would just admit the patient. And so the patient would be here for a few days and so then they would be an inpatient. So the expense to the patient and the family and to our healthcare system in general. So um, they are able to have that direct communication if they do need to send a patient to the hospital and then the doctors can um, talk and then maybe they just come in for say a CT scan then after it's read then they can call the telehospitalist back and then send the patient back to the facility. Okay so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Perlman now. Thank you Robin. So just to elaborate a little bit about Robin was saying in that open communication with the emergency department, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through a clinical vignette here and talk about how another layer of our service doesn't just end with that acute evaluation and treat in place. Uh, we also think that, you know, even if a patient needs to be sent out, that that opens the door to another opportunity that that patient could still be maintained and treated in place. 
Obviously, if they need to remain in the hospital, we would obviously keep them there appropriately, but anytime we can bring them back to their care setting, we certainly try and do that. Uh, one example that we'll go through now is uh, a patient that we would get called on in the middle of the night that had a fever and ad abdominal pain. So the nurse calls us, patient's temperature 102.4, heart rate mildly elevated at 106, normal respiratory rate of 14 with good oxygen saturations at 98%. We have the nurse take the cart into the room. We connect, uh, obtain a history from the patient. They noted that they had acute onset of abdominal pain in the lower abdomen with no radiation. They had some nausea and vomiting associated with this. Um, patient did not have any melanoma or hematochesia, which is essentially bleeding from the intestines and had no prior history of this either. So during that evaluation, we listened to the patient's heart and lungs with the digital stethoscope, able to see them with our high definition camera. Uh, this is one of the opportunities where we really need the bedside clinical staff to assist us. Obviously, the one thing we're limited with on telemedicine is to truly put that hand on the patient. So we allow the staff that's on site there to kind of be our hands in place over there. So in this specific instance, the nurse, we had her palpate the patient's belly in several different spots and noticed that they had some significant pain down in that left lower quadrant area. Given that most of these abdominal findings on there, you, you can tell clinically just by watching the nurse press on the belly and see the patient's reaction that we could tell something significant was going on in there. You know, given the degree of pain in there, we couldn't safely just place the patient on some antibiotics, get some labs and an x-ray and treat the patient in place. It was really important that the patient have some advanced imaging. So at that point, we did authorize the patient to go over to the emergency room to get further imaging and expedite some further lab and clinical workup in there. So what we do at Telehealth Solution is take this opportunity to really create more physician to physician communication. Too often out there, all these healthcare institutions act in silos and there is no communication between providers in there. As Robin alluded to earlier, the good majority of time when these patients come to the ER do have mild clinical conditions such as a simple UTI or something like that, that they can be treated in place but the ER doc has no one to pass that baton of care over to at the facility and doesn't have the reassurance that that patient is gonna be monitored through the night. And so the path of least resistance is just bringing them up into the hospital and not having to deal with that lack of continuity. So in this specific case, we called the ER doctor, told them exactly what was going on. We were sending a patient over. Um, what we suspected was going on and talked about the workup. And at that time, the emergency room uh, doctor, we got a lab work that showed the patient had a mild acute kidney injury from the nausea and vomiting and CT scan did confirm that the patient had a mild case of diverticulitis. The patient got an initial dose of antibiotics in the emergency room and we were able to get that lab work. We talked to the doc and he felt comfortable transitioning that patient back to the facility. So we then called back over to Glenbridge, let the bedside nurse know exactly what was going on, put our further orders in and transition the patient back over to the facility for ongoing care and management. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Um, so now we're going to go into our Q&A session. Um, if you haven't done so already, you have the opportunity to type in questions. There's a, a question uh, box should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we'll spend probably about the next 15 minutes getting to as many questions as we can. And um, if we don't get to them all, 
feel free to, of course, follow up with the presenters. I'm going to put their contact information is listed here on the screen. So if we don't get to it or you have a specific question for one of them, feel free to reach out as well. Just give me a minute to look through some of these questions. So uh, the first one, let's see, might be for Jay or Ron. Um, are all rehospitalizations treated equally? You can take Jay? that. One, no problem. Yeah. So it, it's hard to tell without the exact clinical context. You know, generally CMS focuses around the five clinical conditions that we outlined earlier. Um, so they're not all treated equally. You know, the initial parameters back in the day really were focused initially right around CHF and then MI was added and pneumonia and COPD. So they continue to expand the diagnosis that are included in what is accountable for those 30-day readmits. Okay. <clears throat> for patients not going to a SNF, how are hospitals penalized for readmissions? This is Robin. We, um, as part of our quality metrics, hospitals are graded on all calls readmissions, and we're moving to a uh, payment based on quality, and so in the future, it will affect our payment. Right now, it would affect our um, star rating. So CMS is going to a star rating for pretty much all organizations, skilled nursing facilities, hospitals, home health agencies. So it can affect that as well. But the bottom line is that if your uh, all-cause readmissions are over a certain percentage, then there is a penalty placed on facilities and um, the majority, there's probably a third of the hospitals in North Carolina that have a penalty. Since they have initiated the telehealth at Glenbridge, our readmission penalty has gone down. So that has been an advantage as well. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, how are you integrating this information with your EMR, and what EHRs do you have in place? Oh, sorry, what EHRs do you have in place, and are you using outside telehealth capability instead of EHR? So I guess that's kind of a double question, but the same. So I can take that one. So specifically with telehealth solution, we we think it's very important for that communication to be documented directly into the facility's EMR. So at present, all of our physicians or physician extenders that are on during evening and weekend hours document everything from a simple routine phone call to the full virtual encounter directly into the patient's EMR whether that be point-click care, matrix care, or even hospital-based EMRs, including Epic, Allscripts, or Cerner. So uh, our goal is to document directly into that facility system. And Ron may be able to elaborate a little bit on the bridge of the AMD equipment that can communicate directly with the EHRs. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that I think historically uh, that you know we that that folks have struggled with in telehealth is really how do we mimic the workflow and the transfer of data um, from the clinician when you're at different sites on different electronic health records. Um, you know, clinicians that aren't basically working or are not part of that facility. So um, I can tell you from an AMD perspective, um, our platform has full HL7 integration. And for those of you that aren't familiar with HL7, that's the, basically the language that electronic um, health records speak so that they can, um, they're supposed to talk to one another, but organizations like ours. So when you provide a clinical assessment, you take documents and you might have informed consents, you take an image of an eye, um, maybe you have vital signs, you can literally tag all of that information 
and you can save it to the EMR. And wherever that patient's identif um, identification number is in the EHR, you tag it to that. And so the images that will go, the images go, the documents will go where the documents are supposed to go, the vital signs will go where the vital signs are supposed to go. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Are you using telehealth for remote patient monitoring in other cases, but not charging separately for this application, or capture this as a CPT for reimbursement? Dr. Perlman, you want to talk about how you're doing from a reimbursement perspective with the SNPs that you're working with, and then I can just give an overview in general about um, reimbursement for, for SNPs if you want through Medicare? Sure. So. Okay. As you know, the landscape is ever-changing for reimbursement, and every month new legislation is being passed advancing the requirements and kind of breaking down the barriers to allow that, that reimbursement. You know, initially, all sites had to be rural qualifying sites based on geographic location and distance from a major metropolitan area, but a lot of those walls are being broken down and a lot of the new legislature out there is allowing that uh, even local and in large cities to allow for telemedicine reimbursement. Some states have removed that barrier altogether. Us specifically at Telehealth Solution right now are not doing any direct reimbursement in there, so we are not tapping those Part B bundles that your physicians are billing from and the facilities in there. Probably, obviously, within the next 12 to 18 months with the changing reimbursement landscape out there, our goal is to be able to re reduce our fees to the customer and be able to augment that by direct billing to the customer in there. So um, it's going to kind of be a teeter-totter back and forth based on um, location, billing landscape, and um, the facility's ability to provide us the information to initiate all of the billing. But that's definitely something that uh, will be on the horizon and be initiated in 2019. Yeah, and just to add to that, so that one of the questions was about remote patient monitoring. I don't think, um, Dr. Perlman, you're not using any re remote patient monitoring in the in the um, the skilled nursing facilities, correct? The nurse would basically notify you when there's an issue with a patient, and then you would have a lot. You would basically have the, if needed, you would have the interaction. So I think the answer is no on the remote patient monitor. And as far as reimbursement goes, just to add a little bit on to what um, Dr. Perlman was saying. So, um, you know. Medicare does reimburse for telemedicine um, in skilled nursing facilities. Um, everything in telehealth is is wherever the patient is physically located is called the originating site. So skilled nursing facilities are included as originating sites. I mean, there are some caveats to that, though, as Dr. Perlman said. Um, but one of the interesting things is you look look at what uh, um, like Glenbridge and Appalachian and Dr. Perlman, all these folks are doing is that you know, a lot of the, the uh, there's enough drivers from a financial perspective that reimbursement isn't just the real driver. There's a lot bigger ones than that. But as far as pure reimbursement for Medicare, the patient has to physically be located um, in specific facilities. Skilled nursing facilities, of course, is one of them. And it has to be in a non-metropolitan statistical area or in a HIPSA. But um, we're seeing some changes on that. And as Dr. Promo said, some new legislation um, that we're going to move on that very quick. You would just do a point of service. The clinician would actually get paid the normal rate that they would if they were seeing the patient in person for um, with Medicare, and you can use a Q code and you can actually get a facility fee, which is around $23. It's not huge, so um, there's some real advancements in reimbursement, but it's it's still very friendly, and we see a lot of organizations doing it where the ROI is there. So I hope that answers your question. If you want more specifics, feel free to email me, and I can actually send you. Um, the CPT code billing and the Medicare regs and all of the other things that would that would give you more insight. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying, Ron. Um, it's another question. I thought I heard that the telemedicine evaluation includes an exam that is facilitated by an RN on site. So is having an RN on site a requirement or could this be an LPM? Some SNFs do not have an RN on site 24-7. 
No, we do not require an RN. A good majority of the facilities we cover across the country do have LPNs at night. And the beautiful part about our relationship with AMD and the technology is there really is no skill set required. We actually cover acute care hospitals as well, doing telehospitalist work. And oftentimes during flu season, when emergency rooms are extremely busy and the nurses are tied up with patients, we've had CNAs and even a front desk clerk at times help assist with our exam to help get patients moved up to the floor and outside the ER. So um, the clinical skill needed to assist in the exam is, is almost none. And oftentimes uh, a CNA or LPN in the facilities is assisting us with the exam. Great, perfect. Um, here's another one. Can you address the use of telehealth in an acute care rural hospital with swing beds? Absolutely. So we we do partner with several rural hospitals out there to provide telehospitalist coverage models. Some of these models are nocturnal coverage. Some of them are 24-7 coverage in a supervisory role with NPs or PAs on site. We have built a collaboration between the facilities and the ER doctors where we can actually supervise and be the quote-unquote attending of record for the swing beds out there. Um, in order to make that successful and for it to be reimbursable, um, there needs to be some bylaw changes within the institution to make that a viable solution in there. And so um, we, we've worked that out with several institutions to make that a successful and, and working program to cover the inpatient side along with being able to facilitate the swing beds on site as well. Okay, great. Um, let's see. We'll do one more question here. Uh, were there any challenges with connectivity in rural areas in some of your applications? So for the most part, the technology in the rural areas. Um, you know, a few years ago when we started this, uh, the technology barriers were much greater out there, but with the advent of things being able to take place in the uh, cloud and handshakes being able to take place outside of the system, you don't have to open up vulnerable ports in the system that um, create security risks and threats out there. And so the, the ability to connect in these places from us as an organization has become tremendously easier, even as compared to two years ago. The beauty of it now is that it requires very little connectivity to be able to uh, do a full exam, including video and stethoscope in there. And within the AMD technology, they are able to sort of downgrade video quality and degrade some of the signal that needs to come through in order for us to complete it, even in a much lower bandwidth in there. So, you know, even with minimal signal out there, we've even connected and done exams on Wi-Fi being down over a cell phone signal. So um, that, that barrier, while not gone completely, has been significantly lessened over time. Great. <clears throat> Um, okay, I think we are close to the end here out of time, and I know um, all of you have the information here for each of the presenters, so we ask that certainly you can email myself or any of the presenters here if you have a specific question. We'll be sending a follow-up email um, to all attendees with a link to this presentation as well as to the recording, so um, you'll get a copy of it that you can watch again or share with other colleagues, and I'm going to turn it over to Misty. Well, thank you, Thank Ron. you, everybody. Thank you, Ron, Dr. Perlman, and Robin, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have other questions, as Carrie said, feel free to contact the presenters. Also, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Certificates of attendance will be available upon request for attendees who register 
attend the entire webinar, and participate in the post-webinar survey. We are unable to provide CEUs or CPEs for this session. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.